I'm Claire. I'm a student community manager here at Postman. And today in this workshop, we're finally going to get our hands dirty with code and build an API based off of the schema that uh, we worked on yesterday. So I know for some of you, this might be your first time ever building an API. Um, maybe it's your first time building an API in this language we'll use today. Uh, don't worry at all. Uh, we're we're going to go, you know, make it explain every step of the way. Um, I know probably everyone here has experience consuming APIs, maybe making an API call, using APIs in their applications. But today we'll be on the other side, actually building that API out. Um, so the first thing before we dive into the code is to understand we'll be taking that API first approach today. Um, the schema that you built yesterday will play very nicely with Postman and allow us to take advantage of what's called API first approach to API development. Uh, so what is that exactly? Well, that schema that you worked on yesterday is your single source of truth, not only for the developers that are making the API, but everyone else that is interested in your API. Obviously, the consumers are going to care about it. Um, the testers are going to care about it. They're going to care. The security team might care about it. You can kind of think of that API like a blueprint if you were building a house. The builders, the carpenters care about that blueprint. Electricians, the plumbers, the people moving into that house. Maybe the city needs to know that the house like meets the city um, you know, legal requirements for the zone they're building in. So, you know, it's more than just the, the building aspect. Um, the schema really ties together all the interested parties because the schema in the API world is our blueprint. Um, like we mentioned, this is gonna be important for developers like us today building the API. It'll be important for testers to know our interface so that they know what to test for, what we're expecting our API to do. Uh, documentation. Nobody can use your API if it's not documented. And not only that, um, if you're coming to use the API and it doesn't function the way that it's documented, that's also a problem. Uh, so again, this is why it's so important to have that single source of truth. There's so many parties that are interested in, in any API that's being built. Um, you've done the hard part, getting that schema together. And we're going to be putting that to practice today. So how can Postman help us uh, building out our API in an API first way? Well, every step of the way, Postman is here to kind of hold our hands. We are going to create an API in Postman like we did yesterday, a little bit of a review. We'll use that to generate some tests for while we're coding our API, we can use those tests to you know, debug as we go, make sure we're building the API um, as we expect it to work. And then of course we can generate documentation right from the schema so that the API we've built can actually be consumed by people. And you know, once it's on Postman, it's a public um, documentation, you can share that with the world as well through Postman's API network. All right, so how do we actually build an API? And let me just get the chat open here so I don't miss any questions. All righty. All right, so how do we actually build the API? Well, there's only one rule you really have to keep in mind, and that is to honor the interface. And that interface is what you've defined in the schema that you've been playing around making. So over here, you see a picture of a vending machine. To the user, the user only cares that if they put a quarter in, um, they're gonna get coffee coming out. They don't really care what's happening on the other side of the front of that vending machine. In other words, as long as you're, you know, honoring that contract that you've made with the user that you've defined in your API schema, the user is going to be happy. Um, how you implement behind the scenes is up to you. There's many ways you can deliver this coffee to this user. Um, one of them is like putting a human inside the vending machine. You could have mechanical, you know, mechanisms inside to make that happen. But that's up to you. As long as you're protecting that interface or the front of the vending machine here, you've done your job. So how do we, what can we do inside the vending machine? How do we actually build that API to deliver on our promises that we've made in our schema? Well, there's a lot of options out there. Um, these are just a couple coding languages that can help you build a server. 
that will you know function as your APIs. Um, now, once you like, this is not all of the languages. There are more languages you can use, but once you've picked a language, maybe one that you're familiar with or one that your team is familiar with, uh, each language has a couple of frameworks that help you. They're specifically designed for building, um, you know, web applications. Uh, for example, in Node, there's like Fastify and Express, Koa and Happy. Maybe you've heard of a couple of these, Django, Flask for Python. Today, we're going to be building in Node. Uh, don't worry if you've never seen it in your life. Um, it's just JavaScript. And if you haven't seen JavaScript, that's fine too. We'll, we'll go plenty slow enough for everyone to catch up. Um, Node has a package manager called NPM. This is our tool that we'll use to help get some library dependencies, some utilities that will help us build our project. And finally, we'll be using a web framework called Fastify, which is specifically designed for helping you build APIs quickly in Node. Um, one thing I'd like to mention here, I know yesterday a lot of you were working as Kin was talking, you were playing around in Postman with API schema and building your own, trying things out. That's awesome. We're going to be cramming a lot of content into this workshop. I want to make it you know, fast enough so that you have time to work today. I would say don't try to code along with me. You're going to be following too many things at once. There'll be a recording of this uh, workshop. You can watch it at your pace later if you'd like. I've, I have a GitHub repo that has all the code that we're covering today, including each step of what we do today. So. I, I just love, would love it if you would sit back and relax, um, ask questions while you can, and not slow yourself down trying to code as I go. Just watch. OK, so for those of you that have worked with Node before, you probably have it on your computer. Maybe it came with your computer. If you need to check, um, you can go into the terminal and type node-v. This is like to check if, what version of Node you have. If you have it, a version will come back. If you don't, you, it will say not found. So if you don't have it, um, you can download it from here. And yes, I will share the slides with you after the um, workshop in Discord. So for example, here I have a terminal. And if I say node-v, since I have node, it's bringing back the version um, that I have. If you don't have it, like I'm trying to find a, li a library called foo, it's going to say command not found. So that's how you know if you have node. Once you have Node, it comes with that NPM package manager, so you already have everything you need. All right. OK, so what are we doing? Well, we have the restaurants API schema from yesterday that Kin helped us make. And that API schema had five endpoints, You know, our basic CRUD operations here for getting all the restaurants, adding a restaurant, getting specific restaurants, um, updating a restaurant and deleting a restaurant. So we are going to code all of these endpoints, show you how what goes on behind the scenes in an API. All right, so step one, let's actually dive into the code now. All right, hold on a second. I'm gonna keep this open on the different screen. All right, so we already checked that we have Node. We're good to go. If you want to start a project, the first thing you have to do in Node is create a project folder. So I'm going to go ahead and make a directory called um, Restaurant API, and I'll CD or change directories inside, so that now we're in our new Restaurant API project. You can see it's empty. I use um, VS Code for editing, so if I just say code dot. This is going to open up the current directory in my VS Code, so I'm ready to hit the ground coding. All right, so that's opening up. And we see you have a totally empty project. There's no files in here at all. OK, so how do you start a Node project? Uh, we use npm. So we just say npm init, and that's how we initialize our project. It's going to walk us through this little helper that asks us, OK, what do you want to call your project? We'll give it the default restaurant API, default version. We don't need a description. Uh, entry point will change later, blah, blah, blah. You can press Enter on all of these, and something happened. 
you can see it said about to write uh, to a file called package.json. So if I head over here and say yes, we can start our project. You can see it wrote a file called package.json. And in Node projects, the package.json file is very important because it has all of the you know, metadata about our project is here. We can see the name of our project, the version, um, description, author, all this stuff. We can write custom scripts that we can execute with NPM. We'll be doing that later. But what we want to do is build an API with that Fastify library. So as with any framework you'll be using, you want to check the documentation to know how to use it, right? So we can go to Fastify's documentation website here just by Googling it, not printing it. <laughs> Hold on a second. All right, I was trying to zoom, not print. Hopefully you can see. All right, so here's the Fastify documentation. Most libraries that are great will have like a quick start section that will help you get started quickly. Um, you can see here it says the first thing you have to do is install Fastify. And with Node, we just say npm install and then the name of whatever package we want to install in our project. So I'll do that in our terminal. npm install Fastify, press enter. And now when it's doing, um, it's going out and fetching all of the libraries that Fastify needs to work. And it took a little time, but it's done. If I head back to VS Code here, make this a bit bigger. Uh, now we see there's some extra stuff in our project. I see a folder called Node Modules. And if I open it, I can see there's a ton of stuff. This is all the packages that we just installed um, in order to make Fastify work. So the Fastify itself is here. But also, it, it Fastify itself depends on all of these libraries. So we need everything in order to use Fastify in our project here. Um, you don't have to ever you know, click in here and use these files. Node is going to resolve when we require a package um, in, our, in our own custom files. Uh, but you'll also notice in package.json, it automatically added a dependencies. So this is the list of all of the um, you know, packages that our project depends on. Obviously, we're going to depend on Fastify. <laughs> so um, that's why it's here. There's also a package lock.json. This has to do with metadata about the um, node modules we've installed locally. And it's very important. We never, you don't have to touch this file, but it needs to be in here. OK? All right. So. One more thing, a lot of us like to, oh, I just saw a question in the, um, in the chat. What does it mean three packages are looking for funding? Um, you know, a lot of uh, packages are made by volunteers that are doing open source development. And, you know, it's always nice to buy them a coffee or, you know, help them fund the hard work that they're doing. That's why there's a little advertisement in there. All right, and somebody just put a great comment in the chat as well. Aniket said, once I committed node modules, um, for those of you that don't know, uh, many times when you're developing software, you want to be tracking all of the changes you make with a tool called Git um, that helps you, you know, keep all your versions straight. And we're going to be doing that as well. So in order to start Git, if you have it installed on your computer, and this is optional for those of you that maybe have not done this, I'll just say git init. And it adds a .git directory hidden in our project that will start tracking our changes. All right, so you can see all of the new files are green because they're added to our project. Um, now, to prevent the accident that uh, Aniket experienced about pushing all these many node modules, it's a huge, you know, it's a lot of um, size to push this to like GitHub or someplace you're sharing your code. We want to make sure that we don't do that. And in order to ignore tracking on anything, we can add a .git ignore file, OK? So in here, any directory or file name you put, such as node modules, will now ignore. You see how it turned gray there? Um, it will ignore this from tracking, meaning if we push our code to GitHub, it's not going to include node modules. 
to prove my point, um, if I do get status to show what it's tracking right now, you see that node modules is not included in there, which is which is good. So yeah, that's an extra thing. Like if you're going to use Git in your project, just remember that. All right. Okay, so how are we actually going to get started here? We have installed Fastify, as we see here in our dependencies. So we can start using that in our project. How do we use it? Maybe it's your first time. So we're going to use the documentation. It says here, create a server.js file and add the following content. So I'm just going to copy all this and we'll look at it in the editor here. Now, it's really up to us how we want to architecture our project, what types of naming conventions we want to use. Again, um, the implementation is up to us. We're deciding how to do the inner workings of the vending machine, right? As long as we protect our interface with the API. All right, so we have a source directory and inside here, I'm going to add that server.js file. And this is where we're going to start coding our server. I'm going to paste the code that we copied from Fastify. And we'll, let's take a look at that. So the first line up here, it says const Fastify. So const is short for constant, and it's a way of defining a variable in JavaScript or Node that doesn't change. So uh, we've defined a variable called Fastify. And this require statement is how we import packages from our Node modules. So we have a package called Fastify. We're importing it with the require statement and saving it to a variable called Fastify. We've also added a little config. It's given us the instruction to add. Logger is <clears throat> a tool that it's much fancier than like a, your average console log. It has a bunch of extra data um, that will help us with debugging. OK, but here's where we finally get to something that looks a little familiar to us. Here, we're declaring a route. And a route is the same thing as like a path on your API. So we're making a get path route. Um, and when you're getting the root of the API, whatever comes in the next argument is your handler. So it's what you do when a request is made to get slash, OK? <clears throat> Now, Fastify, the framework, will give us two objects to work with in our handler. The first is the request object. This is going to represent um, the request that the client made. It will also give us um, a response object. It's called reply here. Um, this will allow us to send something back to the, you know, to the client. And whatever we put inside here is going to be what our API does you know, to handle that request. All right, so one important thing to note here is um, you can call this whatever you want, these two parameters. Here it's called request and reply. You could call it potato and banana. That's not very useful for you or for other developers. Um, I just want to get you familiar with a convention that's used oftentimes when coding APIs. Um, the request object is called request, like R-E-Q, just rec. And the response object is usually called R-E-S. So this rec and res. It really doesn't matter. It's just a nice convention. I like it because it's short. And uh, as long as you're consistent, uh, that's fine. And don't use potato banana. That's not going to help anyone. All right. So what's happening inside? We're returning an object that says hello world here. So what's going to happen is whenever someone makes a get request to our API, it's going to return a response of hello world. All right. And down here is where we actually start our server. We define a function called start. And this is um, something about JavaScript. Uh, JavaScript operates on what's called promises for asynchronous tasks, meaning, hey, we're doing something that's going to take a little time. Um, I promise you, I'll, I'll give you uh, the result once it's done. Uh, so you'll have to wait for that. We have to tell a function if it's asynchronous. And in JavaScript, we do that by adding the async keyword right before the parentheses of our function. All right, so inside our function, it's doing, it's trying to start the server here with fastify.listen. 
This await means it's waiting for the server to start. The 3000 inside is the port that our server will be listening on, on our computer. And this catch, you know, in JavaScript, it's a try catch block. It's gonna attempt to start the server. If something goes wrong, it's gonna catch that error and we can log the error and then quit the program. If, if you know, an error happens, we wanna stop everything. Okay, finally, most importantly, we actually call that start function to trigger um, our, our Fastify server to start listening. All right, so let's actually try this out. And, you know, one more thing before we um, start the server up, let's prepare ourselves. We have our schema already from yesterday. So let's get set up in Postman to start debugging um, the API we're about to build. I'm going to head to postman.com. Oops, it always takes me to the marketing website because my bookmarks. All right, postman.com. All right, so I can open up Postman right here in the web browser. And I have to catch up to all of you because I know many of you have already started your workspace and have your API schema all set up. I'm just gonna create a new workspace and paste our schema in. So I've selected create a new workspace and I'll call it API Fest 22. Um, I'll make it just a team workspace for now. All right, so right now our workspace is empty. I'm gonna create an API. We'll call it the restaurant API. And the version is 1.0.0, .0 .0, not 10. We're getting ahead of ourselves. And we'll do the open API 3 YAML schema that you worked on yesterday. Create API. All right, so that's building up. I'm gonna go copy the schema that All right, copy the schema, close this dialog. Here we can head into our version one of our API. And in the definition tab, we, this is the boiler that comes with the, a new API, but we're gonna replace it all with our restaurant API schema. Now this might be a little small. Let me get this a bit bigger here. All right. So this should be pretty familiar. Um, you can see those five paths that Kin introduced yesterday, get post, uh, get an individual restaurant, update a restaurant and delete a restaurant, all of it is here. Uh, what might be a little different is how I define a restaurant. Um, depending on you know, how you guys played around with it afterwards yesterday, maybe you added your own properties. I added um, each restaurant object has an ID a name, a cuisine, and a Boolean, whether or not it has takeout. So those are like the properties on my restaurants. Um, feel free to add your own properties to whatever you know schema you are building. But that's what we'll be working with today. All right, so in order to <clears throat> set, set ourselves up for debugging, I'm gonna do exactly what Kin showed you yesterday is to generate a collection based off of our schema. We're gonna generate um, a test the API, a test collection, and I'll call it restaurant API test and generate that collection. So Postman is looking at our schema and generating requests based off of our, you know, how we've defined each request and our examples. And I can see here, we have our API tests. If I open the restaurants folder, I can see all of those requests um, from our schema. Um, we'll be using this to debug. Um, first and foremost, if I click on the API test folder here, this is our collection, excuse me. If I go to the variables tab, it has base URL all set up for us. Um, but in our schema, <clears throat> we had defined the base for one of our servers as api.example.com. We don't own that domain, so I don't think it does anything for us. What we will have is a local server that I'll boot up in a second um, in order to you know, actually try hitting our API. So let's get there. We've pasted the Fastify getting started code here. In order to get started here, um, with Node, if you want to run a, a file, 
you just type node and then the path to that file. So we'll say source slash server.js. All right, Let's press enter. And you'll see after a second, our server booted up. It is now actively listening and waiting for requests. And here it says server listening at HTTP slash slash blah, 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 blah. Um, this blah, blah, blah number is actually a special number. Uh, whenever you see the IP address 127.0.0.1, this means it's your local server or your local host on your computer, meaning you all can go, try and access this URL, but that has nothing to do with what you're going to, um, my computer, like you have your own local servers. My local server is currently on port 3000, actively listening for requests to our Fastify server here. All right, so let's give it a try. I'm going to copy this URL and we'll take it to Postman, put it as our current value for our base URL. So now, um, let's go ahead and just add a temporary request for our test, uh, our hello world request. So I'll say add request here. I'll name it hello world. And it's a get request to the base URL, our local host right now. And then just slash, right? What we're trying to hit here is this endpoint, right? The get slash endpoint. And if I press send, hopefully we'll get back a hello world response. And we do. We get a status 200 response back. All right. Now, a couple of things. Um, you know, Fastify is pretty flexible. Right now, we've only said return hello world, and it knows, OK, it wants to give us a 200 response back. It's giving it to us in JSON. It's doing that all behind the scenes. Another way to do this and actually use the response object that's given to us is, make this a bit bigger. Instead of return, I can say response.send. Same thing. Okay, and put that inside the send parentheses. Let me make this a bit bigger. Okay. Now let's go ahead and change this a little bit. Maybe say yo world. And let's send our request again in Postman. Do you expect it to be the same or to change? Well, we're getting the exact same thing that we had before. And you see, every time I click this, it's hitting our server and it's logging a request. However, once your server is booted, it's booted at the snapshot of the time that you started your server, right? So any change that we're making inside of here is not going to be reflected until we restart our server. So in order to restart the server, you can, you can kill any pro process in a server with control, or excuse me, in the terminal with control C on most operating systems. Um, so now you see we're back, we're out of a, the server is done. So if I want to start it again, we can type again, node server, oops, I guess it's source server.js. We started the server again with the new uh, saved data. So now if we send it, we're getting yo world back. Now you can see as a developer, this is gonna get old very fast, having to you know, kill the server every time we make a change so we can test it again. Node has a great tool that will automatically listen for any change in our code and restart the server for us. That tool is called Nodimon. I think that's how you say it at least. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and install that real quick using NPM. So I'll say NPM install. And you know, there's a couple of different types of dependencies when you're developing. There's the dependencies that your server needs at, um, in production and at runtime, but there's some dependencies you only need in development, such as the one we're using to build our API. This Nodimon, um, we only need in development. So I'm gonna use npm's dash dash save dash dev. This means, hey, save this package as a dev dependency. Our server doesn't does not rely on this um, library, all right? And I see some uh, questions in the chat here. Can we send HTML code? Yeah, your API, whatever your contract is, if you promise to send back HTML, you can send HTML um, as a response for sure. All right, we just installed Nodimon. I can see in package.json, it's added a new field called dev dependencies. So not regular dependencies, which are just for development. And Nodimon is here. 
Nodimon works exactly like Node. Um, we can say Nodimon, uh, oh, excuse me. I wanted to introduce one more thing. <clears throat> We've been typing like Node source server.js up until now. That also gets old. We can use scripts in package.json to give a nickname to this command here. So I'm going to go and add a new script called start. And that command will be what we've been typing this whole time. So source or node source uh, server.js. So now if we typed, um, instead of writing that whole thing out, I can just type npm start. And npm is going to know start means node source server.js, right? That's much easier, step one. Um, step two is we also want the, the one that listens, right? I'm going to make another command called dev. And this is going to be the way we start um, our development server, the one that listens for our changes. So instead of node, we'll use nodimon, that special package. And we'll do the exact same thing, source slash server.js. All right, and save that. So now if I want to start our dev server, instead of npm start, I'm going to say npm run dev. Um, you might be wondering why you don't need run for start. That's because start is a special nickname in package.json. Um, you can say npm, npm run start if you want, but only with start and uh, maybe a couple other keywords, you don't need the run. But any other nickname we make up for a script, we have to add run before it so it knows to look in the scripts to do this. All right, so we did that this time and it looks a little different than before. We see some logs from Nodimon, but now, now that our server is listening um, using Nodimon instead of node, watch what happens if we go back to server.js and change this up again. I'm gonna change it to yo API fest and press save and Nodimon understood that we changed it and you saw it restarted the server. It said restarted due to changes. The server's back up now. So we can go back to Postman, hit send at the same endpoint. And now we can start keep coding without having to go into the terminal and kill the server, restart it every time. So that's very convenient. All right. Okay, so now we understand you know, the basics in Fastify of how to define a route. We you know, say fastify dot whatever method we're gonna use. We give it the path that will be hitting on the API and a handler here, right? Um, we're using the async here again. Uh, we'll get into that a bit later about why we need async here. Technically, we don't need async yet because we're not doing anything asynchronous, but we will be later. So let's just keep it there. And yeah, Pritam, I actually don't know how other people say Nodimon. Um, that's how I say it in my head, but uh, I'm curious how any of you pronounce it if you read that word. <laughs> what do you say, Nodeman? I don't know. All right. So how are we doing? Um, give a thumbs up in the chat if you're following along all right, or if you're pretty lost, give a thumbs down. I can slow down if we're talking too fast. I'll take a little break here to look at the questions. I see Anatosh asked, what is the difference between dev dependencies and dependencies? What is the purpose of differentiating them? This really comes down to when you're going to like deploy your project um, or if you're gonna make a package that other developers can use, you only want to share the bare minimum of packages they have to download. Because obviously um, if we open node modules, there's a ton of stuff in here, it's pretty heavy. We don't want to also you know, give the burden of all of the development stuff that we only use when we're building our package, right? So that's why we separate dev dependencies and regular dependencies. It helps us uh, only keep the essentials. Okay. All right, so it seems like you all are following along. We've got our first route up and running, um, just our test route, right? But that's not anything to do with our schema yet, right? What is our, our game plan? Well, we have um, you know, these five routes to build and let's do them one at a time. So first we need to figure out how to get all of our restaurants. 
And you know what's going to help is, yes, we have our schema over here in Postman. I also like to copy it and have it right in my project uh, so I can look at it side by side. So I'm going to, in my source folder here, add a new file. I'll call it schema.yaml. And in here, I'll paste our YAML schema. All right. Um, so we're going to be building first our get slash restaurants route. Let's remind ourselves what that's supposed to look like. We have way up here, we have all of our paths defined in our schema under slash restaurants and get. We see that we have to code it to send a 200 response that has this. It's going to send back this restaurant listing. Um, component. So in order to find out what that is, we can scroll down to where our components are defined. We can see that a restaurant listing is an array of restaurant components. And each of our restaurants looks like an object that has these four properties, ID, name, cuisine, and has takeout. So our API, when they hit the slash restaurants endpoint, has to return, you know, as we're promising in the schema here. So let's go ahead and try that out. Head back to server.js. And right under here, we'll add a new route by saying fastify.get. And the first thing is to find the path. It's slash restaurants. Well, let's put it inside the quotes. Slash restaurants. OK. And here, we'll do exactly what we did above with defining an async function with a request object and a response as parameters. And inside of our function, we'll code sending back the restaurants. So our mission here is to send back an array of restaurants, right? Um, we can do that with response dot send. Uh, but where are our restaurants? We'll have to make a little temporary database of restaurants here in our um, server. Um, I'm just going to define a, an array in memory here. So. You could say const or let. Um, I might be changing this in the future, so I'm going to call it let for now. This is for a, defining a variable that can change. We'll name this array restaurants and just initialize it as an empty array here. OK. Um, I'm going to copy our variable name and make sure that's what we're sending back in our response. When we hit get restaurants, it's going to send back a response with the array of restaurants here. All right, so since we have Nodemon or Nodemon, however you want to say it, our server has been restarting this whole time that we've been making changes when I hit save. So now um, I can delete this little hello world test request we had. And because we did this API first approach where Postman you know, built out all of our requests for us based on our schema. All we have to do is go to get restaurants. Our base URL is already pointing to our local host server on port 3000. And the path is already good to go, slash restaurants. I just hit send. And it's hitting our API. You saw our API log something with the request. We see we're getting back an empty array. And that's expected because we defined restaurants as an empty array. Let's go ahead and just add some dummy restaurants um, to play with. Um, we can make an, a, an ID of ABC, a name of um, Puerto Viejo, the cuisine type is Dominican, and does it have takeout? Yes. Okay, that's one restaurant. Let me. If I zoom out one, can you all still see this? Is that all right? Give me a yes if it is okay and too small. I see a lot of yeses. All right, this is a little less claustrophobic, so let's go ahead this way. All right, so we have one restaurant. How about two? I'll just copy this line and make this A, B, C, D, E, F. Uh, we can make this one called Sada's. The cuisine is Japanese. It has takeout false. All right. Oop. All right. So now we have two restaurants in our database. 
our server has been restarting to apply our changes. I just hit send again. And now we're actually getting some restaurants back from our API. So congratulations, we were starting um, to see our schema take shape. We've already knocked out the first route. <clears throat> All right, so let's head back. We have a couple more to finish here. I'm just gonna copy what we had. Oh, you know what, let's just type it up. So it's cool that we can get all the restaurants, but how do we add a restaurant to our little database here? Let's do that next by doing our post request. So we'll say fastify.post and the route here is still restaurants. The method is different this time with post and our handler with our request and response object is there. What do we have to do in order to add a restaurant? The first thing is we have to, you know, get the new restaurant's properties, right? Then we have to add the restaurant to our database. Finally, we have to send something back to the user, to the client. Um, and what do we send back? Well, that's what our schema will tell us, right? Um, let's go ahead and look at our post restaurants request. So the response we need to have sent back is a 201 response with the new restaurant that we've just um, just created. So, excuse me, here we'll say send back the new restaurant as a 201 response, okay? So first things first, how do we get the new restaurant properties? Well, our schema is expecting a request body, right? We define that in the schema. And we can see because we had a body defined in our schema, Postman's already given us like an example body to try this out with. Um, there's some funny looking, you know, Latin in here, but at least the data types match our schema. These are strings and then take out as a Boolean. So <clears throat> how do we get data from the body of our request? Well, first let's take a look at what we're actually getting in our request whenever anyone hits post restaurants here. Um, in order to actually send this, the API is gonna get mad unless we're actually sending some sort of response. So I'm just gonna you know, return some dummy response, like message, okay, for now. Okay, so let's actually hit the post restaurant with this fake request body here, hit send. We get back the response we expected, but you'll see oh, this big object was logged into our server logs here. All of this stuff is living on that request object that Fastify gives us. There's so much information here. Um, importantly, you know, here we can see there's a request.body that has all of the data from our request that we just made in Postman. There's other things like the query parameters, if there were any, um, any path parameters would be in here. We can see information about the request itself, you know, the, the path that we, the URL of the request and the method, et cetera, a whole bunch of other stuff in here. We just care about the body, right? So let's take a look at the request body and send this again down here. And we see that we're logging that body right here. So just by saying rec.body, we can access all of the properties that the client is sending us to make the new restaurant. Um, I just wanna take a side, I see a question here from Anatosh. Why are we using async and handler and fastify? What can be the possible purpose of making functions asynchronous and when do we use it? So like I said, right now, it really doesn't make sense that we're using the async keyword because nothing in our API is asynchronous. It's all, you know, JavaScript, regular synchronous operations. Something that might be asynchronous and will be later is maybe you want to write something to an external, you wanna call another API even. That's gonna depend on how long it takes that API to respond. The, the program doesn't, or the server doesn't know. So you have to explicitly tell it to wait for that response if you want it to be synchronous. Um, we'll get to that later, but great question. Okay, so we know how to get the body from a request. Let's try and adding that now to our restaurant's um, array. So 
we're going to get our restaurant, uh, const new restaurant from the request body. I'll just take the parameters that we get from our body and save it to something a variable called new restaurant. And I'll move that right under a comment here. Now we need to add it to our little database or array. So we'll say restaurants.push the new restaurant, right? Um, push is a function in, or a, yeah, a method on an array that you can add an item to your array in JavaScript. All right, finally, we have to actually send back not this dummy message, but uh, the new restaurant as a 201 response. So we can use our response object. We're going to send back the new restaurant that's just been added like that. Now, by default, Fastify will send a 200 response, you know, a 200 OK. If you want to send any other request or, excuse me, response status code, you have to explicitly tell it to with the code um, method. And here we'll put uh, 201, because this is how we want it to, to work. All right, saved it. So it started the server again. Let's try this out. We should expect now whatever we send it will come back to us in our response, right? Because it's our, it's our new restaurant. So I'm going to click send. And you see we get that back. That's expected. Now, since it's actually saved that, it's pushed it to our array. If we try and get our restaurants again, we'll see we have a third restaurant, the one with the crazy Latin. That's cool. Um, one fun trick I like to do in Postman is you know, it's boring to use the same stuff over and over again, but it also takes a lot of work to keep typing stuff over and over. Postman has this cool um, helper called dollar random. So it's a, you can add like random variables and interpolate it into your request here. So let's say for the name of a restaurant, we take like a random first name. Um, you see, as I'm typing random out, it has a list of all the random things you can choose from, like random booleans, cities, countries, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of stuff here. You can take your time looking through if you want. We're going to use random first name and a little apostrophe s. And then maybe a random, I don't know, random word. OK. And for cuisine, maybe we take a random country. So random country. Notice how I'm putting this inside of the quotes because it still needs to be a string. Um, however, with like has takeout, that's a Boolean. It doesn't have any quotes, right? We can just directly type it in here. So dollar random Boolean. OK, we'll leave this as that for now. Now each time I hit send, you can see we're actually getting different things down here based on Postman's random. And this is just a way more fun of, way of debugging than looking at the same Latin over and over again. Um, let's go ahead and look at our restaurants now. And you can see each time we've been adding a restaurant, it gets added to our little database. OK, but there's a couple of problems here. Um, one of them is you notice an ID is supposed to be unique, right? Um, here we have the same ID over and over. Something that you usually don't want to do with an API is have a user define the EID. You want to do that on the API side yourself so that you can guarantee that it's unique, um, so that you can guarantee that it's uh, hard to guess, like if you need it to be kind of secret. So let's go ahead and add that uh, to our post so that the user doesn't have to add an ID. So in order to do that, the only thing we have to do is before we push um, our restaurant to our database, we just have to add an ID property to it. So we'll say a new restaurant. And since it's an object, we can say dot ID and assign an ID to it. Now, how can we guarantee that this ID is unique? Um, there's a lot of approaches you can take to this. Um, have you ever heard of a universal unique identifier or a UUID? Um, there are libraries that help you generate these random UUIDs. Uh, one of them is called UUID out there. Um, another is called the Nano ID, and that's what we'll use today. I like Nano ID because it's kind of short. So I'm going to actually, I want to keep my server on, and I can't really type anything in here while my server's on. 
So I'm going to say uh, Command Shift T to open a new tab in my terminal. The server is still running over here, but I need to go out and fetch this library that will help us generate an ID. Uh, I'll say npm install nano ID. There are many libraries out there that do this. Um, this is just one of them. And we're going to import that into our server here. So I'll say const nano ID equals require nano ID. So the package we just fetched from npm. Now, you might be wondering why is nano ID inside curly braces here and fastify is not. If you're new to the JavaScript world, you'll learn very quickly that JavaScript has a lot of uh, loosey goosey, not um, standard things. There's many ways to export a library from, from a file. And so the only way you know how to import it is if you read the documentation. I know, because I've worked with nano ID before, is that the way to import it um, here is with curly braces. Fastify, the documentation told us to do it this way. So that's how you know, check the documentation. But now we have nano ID here in our server.js file, meaning, right, where we're trying to assign a new ID on our restaurant, we can just call nano ID and it will generate a random ID. Okay, so that's going to override any ID that comes from the user. Let's give it a try. I'm going to hit send again since our servers are started. And now we see every time that we send it, we're actually getting a random ID and the user doesn't have to enter anything. In fact, we should get rid of this because it's misleading, right? We only care about the name, cuisine, and whether or not it has takeout from the user. I can hit send again and bam, we've got all that. Now you might be wondering, does this still respect our contract? And the answer is yes. Um, I don't know how many of you look carefully at the contract that um, Kin shared, but if we look at our restaurant component down here, only those three are the required ones. ID is optional. Um, if you look up here for the post request, yeah, it's respecting a request body that has a restaurant. And remember, ID is optional on our restaurant object. So even though the ID is missing, it still aligns with our schema and that's fine. Normally, you'd probably want to be super strict in your schema and have like a component called restaurant new restaurant input or something that uh, you know is separate from a restaurant listing. However, um, I'm okay with being lazy every once in a while. We'll just use recycle this same restaurant object for both our input and for listing a restaurant. Okay. Let me just take a look at the chat. How we do in here? Yesterday, ID was space caused the issue while fetching in path. Right. So Sahil just mentioned um, IDs usually don't have spaces because that's going to mess up a path if you have a path in your ID or excuse me, an ID in your path. We got rid of that um, crazy Latin example that Postman spit out. Now all of our IDs are definitely not going to have spaces because nano ID does not put spaces in the ID. Uh, Anantu says UUID package can also help. Yeah, there's, there's hundreds of packages out there that will generate IDs. JavaScript is always in panic mode. Yes, developers of JavaScript are also in panic mode. Uh, another question here, can we use numbers in ID and numbers should be auto increment? Yeah, there's, you can use any system you want um, for you know, creating unique identifiers, like one, two, three, four, five is fine too. One thing to note about that though, is if you use incremental identifiers, it's easier for a hacker to come and like scrape all the data from your database. Like if you have user ID one, ID two, ID three, ID four, it's easy for them to like write a script and just add one to the user's ID and you know get all of your user data, for example. So typically what's nice about these random IDs is that they're very hard to guess. And once you have one, doesn't mean you can just add one to find the next user or entity. So I recommend using UUID when you can. It's more secure. Um, how is name generating random? We're doing that with Postman's helper. You see these double curlies and it says dollar random. Um, you can do like random words, random booleans like we um, demonstrated earlier. And this is built into Postman, yeah. it's a, um, I believe it uses the faker library under the hood. Which is better, Fastify or Express? Um, that's up for debate. 
Express is going to give you, I, I chose Fastify because um, there's less configuration you have to do to get it working. If you want more hands-on, like, you know, driving a stick shift car as opposed to an automatic car, Express can be good for really customizing stuff. Fastify is great for getting started quickly. You don't have to worry about air handling. It has it built in. Um, request validation we'll get to in a second. Uh, you'll see, uh, we'll be touching on some of these later. Um, Faker is not gone, by the way. Uh, it's still around. There was a brief interruption. OK, um, where were we? Where were we? We had just made our post request. And we have our ID saving and everything. So great, we've knocked another route off of our list. Now we're going to move into these last three real quickly. All right, so here in server, where are we here? We need to add getting a restaurant. So we'll say fastify get our route here is going to be slash restaurants oh if i spell restaurant right and then id and we'll use the colon here to tell fastify this is a path variable whatever comes after that slash right there we're going to nickname it id so we can grab it from our request parameters right so we'll do that in our handler i'll say async rec res and in here, we need to do what? First, we have to you know, get that ID from the params. So we know which restaurant we're trying to find. Then we have to actually find it, find the restaurant. All right. Okay. Finally, we have to return the restaurant. Uh, with the caveat being, it has to exist in order for us to return it, right? Uh, so if it doesn't, we'll say if exists, or if it doesn't exist, then we return a 404 not found, if not exist, right? Okie dokie. So first things first, uh, how do we get the ID from the parameters? Well, Let's take a look again at console log, our rec.params. Remember we saw that when we were looking at the request object earlier? Let's do that. And again, we'll make a dummy uh, response.send, foo, we'll send some text back. Um, let's see what happens when we hit the restaurant slash ID endpoint now. So again, Postman, because we're API first, we already have all of our requests ready to go. All we have to do is put a better ID than this crazy Latin in here. Um, we can go ahead and grab one of our IDs from here, like ABC. Go back to our get request and put the ID ABC here. And I'm going to hit send. And it's just going to send us back foo because that's how we coded it. But if we look at our server logs over in the other tab here, we can see that the rec.params is an object that says a key of ID and a value of our ID, right? So that's how we can grab that ID from our request. Now, what do we want to do with that? We want to find the restaurant in our restaurants array up here that has that ID. That's it. So I'm going to say a new variable called restaurant, and we'll assign it as whatever we find. And we say restaurants array dot find. This is a method on for arrays in JavaScript to find something that matches the condition. We can find the restaurant, I'll call it R, where the restaurant's ID matches, triple equals, that's how you match a, a string in JavaScript. So the ID has to match the ID that we got from the request parameters, which we haven't defined yet. Let's go ahead and do that right here. Const ID equals rec.params.id, right? Um, quick note, in JavaScript, this is a little redundant, saying const id equals rec.params.id. We see id is here twice. We can use, uh, this is a little advanced, but it'll make you look really cool. We can use uh, what's called destructuring um, just by wrapping this id in curly braces. And by doing that, we're actually just plucking the ID property off of params here. And it, you can see it's shorter. It looks a little cleaner. You can pluck multiple things, you know, thing two. 
off of params. This is just a, a, a shortcut for saying const id equals rec.params.id. Little, little trick there. Um, OK. So now we should be getting back the restaurant that matches the ID from our request. Let's uh, send it back if it exists. So we'll add an if statement. So if we get a restaurant back, right? So if a restaurant exists, we will send response back. We want to send back that restaurant. Restaurant. Okay. Um, otherwise, we want to send back a message. It says uh, restaurant or no restaurant with ID. And in here we can say dollar curly braces. This is how you can interpolate uh, variables into your strings in JavaScript is if you define your string with backticks, and then inside, if you say dollar curly brace, you can you can type JavaScript inside of there and it will interpolate into your string. So no the restaurant with ID, whatever ID was sent, found. Okay. So now we have all of the oh wow. Uh, we have all of the ingredients to build out our API here. Let's go ahead and try this. We're gonna try to find the restaurant with ID ABC. Hit send. And yes, we're getting something back. Um, we don't have a restaurant called Foo. So let's try getting Foo. And we see we're getting back just some text here that says no restaurant with ID Foo found. What's misleading though is we're getting back a 200 response. That usually means okay. Because remember, that's the default with Fastify. Let's go ahead and change that to code um, 404, right? For a not found error. Now I know that this was not included in our basic schema, and ideally it should be. Um, you see up here in post, we've only, or no, we're on get now. We've only defined a status 200 response. We should usually think of what things could go wrong when somebody is making an API request, and you would add in your schema, um, you know, like. In the event of a 404, you know, we would send back a message, blah, blah, blah. So normally you should. We're just doing a little shortcut version today um, to be nice to the user so they know why the call didn't work if they make a, a, a bad call. But yeah, that's just, I want to also show you how you can send back um, 400 level errors using dot code. All right, we got that one done. I know it's, uh, we're going. Uh, I guess on an hour has it been since we started? Not too bad. I'm trying to finish this up in like an hour and a half. So aiming for that. Um, we'll go back to our server. We've knocked out the get. There's only two more and they're similar. First, um, we have put restaurants ID. This is going to be for updating a restaurant in our little database, right? Um, because it's kind of similar to get, I'm going to copy it all, paste it here. What's different is this one is a put request, same path, right? But our handler here, yes, we're going to get the ID of the um, uh, restaurant that needs to be updated, so we know which one to update. But instead of, um, oh, we also need to check that the restaurant exists, so we'll keep this, right? So if the restaurant exists, in here, we will update the restaurant, right? So how do we do that? Well, just let me catch up. I see like a couple questions here. Um, are any artifacts shared after the session? So yes, like I would love it if you not be coding along, you can just pay attention and relax because we'll send the slides. We're gonna send all the code, don't, we, don't worry about it. Um, we just got a good question here, difference between post and put. So again, first of all, these are all totally conventional. Um, as you can see, we choose what happens when you hit uh, get blah, 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 or post blah, blah, blah. We control everything that happens in our API. The conventions are with post, 
we use that if you're adding something new to your you know, record storage. So for example, when we're adding a restaurant, that's a new restaurant. Put is for you know, changing existing information. So we're gonna be updating a restaurant. That's why we use put. Okay, great question. Um, I just realized with JavaScript, in order to update um, an item in an array, we have to know the index of that item, right? Um, uh, also, if that index doesn't exist because like we had like a bad ID, we'll know that it doesn't exist. So let's go ahead, instead of getting the restaurant here, I'm gonna delete all this. And we're gonna say like found index. So we're gonna go through our entire array of restaurants and see if that ID exists. So we'll go through our restaurants array and we'll say um, find index. Here we are. And we can find an index that matches some condition. Again, we'll say R for restaurant and we'll find the restaurant with the ID that matches our ID from the parameters, right? So what's gonna happen here is Whatever ID comes in on our request parameters, we're going to cycle through our database and find the one that matches um, one of our restaurants. And it's going to return this find index function will return the index of that item. Um, for example, if we did ABC, it's going to return index zero, right? Now, if the item does not exist in our database, it's going to return negative one because you can never have like a negative one in your array, right? So that's how we can know if it doesn't exist. So instead of restaurant like we did earlier, we can say if the found index is greater than negative one, meaning it found it in our array, that means we can't update that restaurant. So here we will go into our restaurants array. Where are restaurants? And we want to go wherever that found index was on that to grab that to assign that item a new value and remember we're also going to get a body on this request because we're updating and sending some data about what the new data is so we need to figure out how do we you know um change like add overwrite all of that new data onto our existing um restaurant the way we do that is First, we need to get that old data so that we have you know, a starting point. So we'll say like the old data is, we'll just make a little copy. Well, this is, new, this is a reference, not a copy, okay? We've got old data here. This is what the restaurant at that um, index was. Now in JavaScript, there's this really cool um, operator called the spread operator. And you use dot, dot, dot. And what this does is just like takes all the properties of that object and then you know lays them back out into an object again. We're making a copy right now of old data. And what we can do is say comma and we can spread again over the top of it to overwrite with any new properties. So I'm gonna spread uh, whatever we get in our request body over our old data. So we'll overwrite any change, right? The reason we do this is, again, um, the user, um, we want to keep the ID of that original restaurant, right? And we don't want the user to update the ID, right? Okay, so we're going to send back the restaurant, or are we? Let's look at our schema. And we need the put here. It says we send back a 204. So, you know, 200 levels still means it's a success that we're sending back, but no message. We send back silence with a thumbs up. So let's go back here. We don't need to send back the restaurant uh, server.js like we did before. Instead, we can send an empty with the code 204. Because remember, we must honor our contract. This is the way we've designed it. All right, and this can stay. Like if the ID is not found, we want to tell the user. Okay, well, let's try this out. Uh, let's go to our put. Thank you, Postman, for having made this already for us. Let's replace this crazy Latin ID with an actual restaurant ID, like ABC. 
were to put here, place ABC as our ID and our path. And Postman also added that body from our, our schema. Um, remember, we required a request body for this one. Let's just give this a recognizable change, like updated name and updated cuisine. Uh, take out true, and we don't need ID. Let's get rid of that. Okay. If I send this off, we should expect a 204. So we're saying it was a success. It found the ABC and it should have edited it. So let's go and get all of our restaurants again. And I see there's ABC here. And it says updated, updated. So this is working. We're, we're updating our data in our database using put. Now you might have noticed um, we used to have more restaurants here. And when we sent this again, those other restaurants disappeared. And that's because we are restarting our server every time we hit save in the code editor. Anytime we've gone and made changes, we're restarting our server. The downfall of what we're doing right now, storing all of our restaurants in memory, is that every time we restart the server, it's like, you know, it's got a blank slate memory. Everything we've added before is gone. It's always going to start with this ABC, D, E, F restaurants only. We're going to swap that out later to show how to persist data. Uh, but for now, we'll just keep our temporary database. Just understand that's why the restaurants keep disappearing every time we uh, save our code. Okay. All right, almost done. I promise this last one is really fast because delete is like the exact same thing as update, except instead of put, this is delete. And here we have, we get the ID. We need to find the restaurant's index, right? It's an index here. And if it exists, instead of updating it here, we're gonna delete it. And the way you can delete an item from an array in JavaScript, we'll take our array and we can use the splice method. Here, we wanna splice it at the index where we found it. And we just wanna chop out one item at whatever index. So we can say splice found index one. And this is gonna delete um, an item in our array at the given index. And I believe we wanna send back 204 for this one as well, but let's check our schema. Here it says delete and response 204. Okay, so that should do everything. Let's go ahead and try to delete ABC updated this time. Well, we saved it a couple of times, so it has its old name again, I'll hit send. Oh, we didn't save it. Good catch. <laughs> save so that we restart our server, okay. I'll hit send again. It should be back to our default data. So let's try the delete with the ID ABC. Hit send, we get back a 204. Let's go check our list of restaurants and this one should disappear. There we go. We only have one restaurant left in our database. Um, now, if we try to delete ABC again, we should get a 404, yeah. So awesome. We've covered all of our paths. Um, how are you guys feeling? That, that was a lot of information. Are you still, are you still following? Give like a thumbs up if you are feeling good about this or like a, a swirly face if you're a little confused, no worries at all. Doing okay? Yeah, and I know a lot of you are asking about the recording. There will be a recording and all the code and all the slides, don't worry about it. Okay, so there's just two more things um, I'd like to touch on before letting you go. One is the problem we've already looked at. Um, well, I'll say what happens here. I could post uh, instead of name, I can call this foo. Nothing is stopping me right now. Watch this, I'll, I'll send. And now we're getting a restaurant called foo Stephanie's public key. And our API doesn't care. It's just gonna take anything it gets. And now we've broken our schema, right? This is not uh, what we're expecting to give back. And this is gonna confuse anybody trying to consume our API. So we need to protect our request with what's called validation. So we need to validate our requests. And there's a lot of ways you can validate requests in APIs. You know, one way is manually, like you can um, check and like, if there's no, 
if there's no ID in the parameters, then you can like throw some error that's like a and or send certain response codes back, etc. Usually, if like a parameter is missing, you want to send back like a 400 level error. That's a client error for a bad request. Um, Fastify itself has a native validation tool. So if we look at the Fastify documentation here, go to docs. And down here, there's a validation somewhere. There. Um, validation section here. Um, you can see like on a post request, you can add a schema and tell it what it's expecting. You can do that there. But um, since we're API first, we've already defined our whole schema for our API. So there's a way for Fastify to know what to expect and to automatically send back like a 400 level error if somebody sends a bad request in, okay? And there's a library out there called <clears throat> Fastify Open API Glue. And maybe whichever framework you're using might have something similar. <clears throat> I know Express has an open API um, handler for validating your request as well. Um, here, it's this little package called Fastify Open API Glue. We um, set some options on it, pointing to our API spec, which we have in our project now, and then defining a service, like how to handle requests um, based on our spec, okay? Uh, and we just register this plugin to our Fastify API, that's it. Um, this other stuff is optional. We're gonna ignore it for now. Well, let's go ahead and uh, just add this real quick. So I'll say npm install. We've been saying install all the time, but that's a shortcut. You can just say I. Um, make sure you spell all this right. Fastify open API glue. We go out and fetch that package from npm. Okie dokie, there we go. And now we're gonna copy this here, paste it into our server and get rid of all the stuff we don't need. All right. So it's saying point to your specification and ours is right next door here. So we'll just say current directory slash schema dot YAML. I think that's the location of it. <clears throat> Let me just double check my notes real quick and make sure that I did that right. Yeah. All right, so their name, this is how in Node you can get the current directory that you're working in. And we want to go slash uh, schema.yaml. And then a service, we're going to have to add a file called service.js in order to handle of our request. So I'm going to touch source slash service.js. Here we are. And in here, I'll give you the lowdown because I've looked at the examples. We're going to make a class called service. And we'll be exporting that class with module.exports service like that. And the way classes work in JavaScript is you have a constructor and we don't need, really need it. So we'll just leave an empty constructor. Now this class is gonna have a couple methods. These methods are gonna be the handlers for all of our routes. Um, oh yeah, thank you all for sticking around. I, I really wanna get through this. So sorry if I'm rushing through. Um, all right, so here's the fun part. In our schema, if you notice real closely, each of our routes or our paths has an operation ID that is unique to that path. We have get restaurants here, add restaurant, get restaurant without the S, uh, update restaurant, delete restaurant. Um, we're gonna use this ID as the name of our method and this open API glue library will know to map our handler to that request, okay? Which is pretty magical. So here we have get restaurants as one and 
this is how you define a, um, a method on a JavaScript class. We're going to make that same rec res as the handler from before. Um, but we're going to do this five times for each of our operation IDs. We had add restaurant and get restaurant without the S and update restaurant. And read restaurant, I believe it was. So we've got all of our handlers here. Oops, when I saved it, it got all pretty. Now, the only thing we have to do is just move everything that we had in here over there. So I'm just gonna cut, the, oh, we don't even need this one anymore. That was our hello world guy. We're gonna just copy or cut this out, paste it into our new service here. Because um, the open API glue library is just a wrapper around Fastify. We still have access to the request and response. This is from Fastify. Uh, so all of our stuff works as is in there. So I'm gonna cut this out, paste it into our posting for restaurants. Same with getting a restaurant. We'll paste it into our service over here and putting the restaurant, updating it. Cut that out, put it into our update restaurant. Finally, we will grab the delete restaurant code and paste it into our service. All right. Now we can delete all this stuff in here. We need to bring our little database over to our service so it knows what restaurants means, right? So I'll go back to service. I'm going to go to the top of our file here and put our little fake database in. Anything else? Oh, yeah, we also had that nano ID when we're creating a restaurant. We need to make sure that's in the same file as our class here. Okay. All right. So that was a lot. The only thing we did was move all of our code into a service class that the library is expecting um, with these special names add restaurant, guest restaurant, et cetera. Um, and the only, the, this is very important, the name of our methods, remember, because that's how the library knows which request we're talking about. And it's how it's going to know which request to validate um, for what things, right? So now that we have all of this set up, hopefully there's no errors, and there is an error here. It says service cannot be invoked with, a, ah, okay, my bad. Here it's pointing to a file, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, we need to actually require that. So let's get our service from next door. So we'll require dot slash to make sure it's in our project. If you have no um, path, if it's just uh, directly imported, like up here, it thinks it's a node module. So we need to make sure it knows it's a local file and say uh, service.js. <clears throat> so we're importing our service. Now we need to create an instance of it like that, by saying new service. And if, if this doesn't make sense, that's okay. This is kind of an advanced <clears throat> concept and you will have the code later. You can copy this whole thing and you know, use it in your project if you'd like, as long as you understand um, you know, why we're doing this. All right, so now the errors are gone. We can go back into Postman and just make sure we're actually getting our restaurants again. Awesome, back to our default restaurants here. Um, but now let's say we do try to mess it up. Let's try and send our, our foo instead of name. See what happens. Aha, it won't let us now. Um, now we're getting a 400 bad request. The only reason is because of our schema. Um, it says right here, body must have the required property name. This is super handy because now all of our requests are having this validation making sure that our users are entering the right type of data. And again, it's because we have a single source of truth that this library knows how to handle all of our requests. All right, so that's why we do request validation. Um, last thing, okay, I know it is, uh, I guess we're hitting the hour and a half mark now. Would you guys have the energy just to learn how to do a little database connection so that we don't lose every time we restart our server. 
and I know this is like, I think it's a very important topic to cover because um, you have such a short time in this uh, API Fest. If you know how to do this, hopefully it will help you. All right, as you know, every time our server restarts, we're losing all of our restaurants, right? <clears throat> we keep coming back to these two. There's a, we have to persist our data somehow beyond the session of our server starting. And we can do that with uh, a database. Now there's tons of database options out there. Let's take a little look. Um, yeah, there's, there's tons of database options out there. Maybe you've heard of like PostgreSQL, MongoDB, Redis, or, you know, there's other like NoSQLs like Firebase, et cetera. You I guess we normally lost, uh, oh, hey. lost you for some time. Okay. For a minute, for a minute. Yeah. For a minute. All right. Uh, do you know what I last said? <laughs> or Redis. Oh, okay. You didn't lose me that long. Okay. Yeah. I was just saying there's a couple different types of databases. We will do MongoDB here as our example, um, just because it's so quick and easy to set up. So if you've never done anything, um, here's how you can do MongoDB. Um, now, normally you would want to set up your project so that you have like a local database where you're working in your project on your computer only with a special database. To be quick today, we're going to use a remote database that's hosted in the cloud, um, which is great for production. Normally you wouldn't use it for development, um, but just to save time, we're going to do that because it's a little complicated to set up a local database. Okay. Um, there's a couple of free services out there that will hope host your database for you. My personal favorite is called um, railway.app. And it's kind of a newer service. Not a lot of people know about it, but I love this. I'm just gonna, you can make a free account here and I have an account already. So I'll say start new project. You can see there's a ton of different stuff you can host on um, railway. Uh, there's Redis database, Postgres database, MongoDB, which is what we will do. Um, you can also connect your repo and actually host your API here as well. So think about that if you're going to be deploying your API. There's also MySQL for database. We're going to make a MongoDB, so I'll click that one. Yes, Aditya, we're going to share all the resources. Don't worry about it. Um, so this just takes a little second. It's building a, a MongoDB you know, cloud database for us to call from our project. Uh, Harsh says BRV going to check out Railway. Don't do it after the workshop. Um, it will still be there, I promise. All right, so it comes with this little setup page. It tells us how to get started. Um, you actually don't have to get any of this uh, CLI stuff. You can just click right here at MongoDB. And if you go to the Connect tab, it gives you this special URL to connect to the database. Now, this is normally something you don't want to share on a live stream with 100 people. This is a secret and you should protect it. Um, however, I trust you not to abuse it while we're on this live stream. Please do not spam my database. This is, I'm trying to do this for your benefit. <clears throat> I will delete this database after the workshop. So again, when you hear the word secret, you need to understand how to handle secrets in your projects. And this is very important. Um, we can make um, a little .env file to hide, our, well, anything that based on our environment we can put in there. So I'm gonna to say touch.env. This is a special convention for where we hide, or not hide necessarily, but it's where our environment variables will live. You can see it has a little gear here in VS Code. I'm gonna um, call this, uh, I don't know, DB connect URI. And I'm gonna paste that Mongo DB connect URI right here. Oh just without the quotes there, <laughs> okay? All right, so it starts with MongoDB protocol slash slash, right? Now, real quick, we right now you can see this is green. That means it's being tracked by Git and we don't want it to be tracked by Git because that means we might accidentally push it to GitHub. So we're gonna add this file .env to our Git ignore. It should turn gray, great. So now it's not being tracked by Git. Our secret is safe here. A quick good practice is I like to 
copy or duplicate, I guess copy this file and rename it to like .env.example so that you know yourself in the future, if you have this project on a new computer, because .env is not pushed to GitHub, you will forget that you need this maybe. So having this example checked into GitHub without the secret, <laughs> just leave it blank like this. This will be a reminder to you in the future to add this in your project or to another developer that they need to have a URI in order to use your project. Okay, so this does nothing. It's just kind of a helper where we're actually saving our variable in .env. Okay, how do we actually use the secret in our project? In Node, there's a special package called .env for .env. I'm going to install that real quick. Now we have, if I click on package.json, you'll see we have .env saved here. And to use that in our project, um, anywhere we type process.env, we have access to all those variables in that file. So I could say like uh, db, what was it? Connect URI. And just to prove my point, I'm just going to council log this so we can see it real quick. <clears throat> this is a good thing to do to check and make sure that your dot end is connected, which we haven't done yet. So first we have to require the dot env package. And we can just directly from here say dot config. This is going to set up, um, it's going to pull all of those environment variables and make them accessible in our project from this file. So now, because we've done this line six here, we can use process.env. Whatever variable name was in our env file here, right? Let's make sure this works before we continue. I'm going to save our server file here. We should expect some MongoDB to be logged here. So go back here. And yeah, it already restarted the server. We can see that it's now logging uh, our value here. So it's connected. We're great. But we're not connected to our database yet because we need to, uh, once our server starts, we need to make sure that uh, we, we call our database to connect to it, okay? And the way we do that is with, this is the last library we're gonna add. I promise we're almost there. Thank you for your patience. Um, yeah. Well, it looks like we lost uh, Claire for a minute. Let's hold on for a minute. Uh, till then, you can, folks, you can see the um, question. Uh, Claire, we lost you for a minute. Okay. Hey, sorry about that. My internet's not great. No problem. I was just saying, um, Anatush said it right in the chat. We're going to use a library called Mongoose to talk to our MongoDB database that's up in the cloud. Um, I just did npm install Mongoose. So we have it now in our project. Now we have to connect to our database once uh, the server starts. And you can get this code on the Mongo, on the Mongoose um, uh, documentation. I just copied it from there. You'll see here, after we start our server, we're gonna make sure that we connect to our database here just by saying mongoose.connect. And then we grab that uh, URI <clears throat> and then it will log DB connected. So now we should just double check our server. Something went wrong. It says mongoose is not defined. That's because we forgot to require it. So let's go up here. const mongoose equals require mongoose. And hopefully that will satisfy it. Good. So not only is our server started, but now it says MongoDB connected. So great, we're now connected to the database with this connect URI in the cloud. We're actually talking to that one we just made in Railway, which is awesome. But so far we aren't using the database, right? <clears throat> so with, um, with Mongoose, we can create something. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna rush through this because I know I've been taking a lot of your time, but you, you will get the code. So don't worry about that. We can make a folder called models and we have to tell it what a restaurant is in order to talk to our database. So I'm gonna make a file called restaurant.js. And in here, in order to um, 
talk in a way that Mongoose understands. We're going to use the Mongoose library. So I'll import Mongoose with const Mongoose equals require Mongoose. Okay. We have Mongoose now in our restaurant model. And now we have to define, we want to define a restaurant schema. This is a Mongoose schema, not an open API schema, okay? So we'll just call this restaurant schema, a new variable, and we'll make a new Mongoose schema. Now, you don't have to remember this. All of this is in the Mongoose documentation. Um, and of course, you can reference my code if you're doing something similar. We have to tell it what does a restaurant look like. We know our restaurant has a name that is a string. We know our restaurant has a cuisine, which is also a string. And without the S, it also has has takeout, which is a Boolean. Okay. All right. That's it. The only thing we have to do is make sure that we export this. So module.exports equals mongoose.model. We make a model out of our restaurant. We have to give it a name. Yes. Restaurant. This is so hard to spell restaurant. There we go. And once we've given it a name, we just give it the schema as a second argument. So what this does is it turns whatever we've built here, our schema, into a model using the model function. Um, and it gives it the name of what we give it here. So finally, we have a model that we can use to talk to our database about restaurants, okay? So real, real quick, we're just gonna convert, we're gonna ditch our, our old DB, goodbye. And we're just gonna replace our functions in here with the mongoose way of talking to, <clears throat> to our database, okay? So now, um, again, this is gonna be in the mongoose documentation about how exactly to get everything. Instead of our array of restaurants being stored in our server, we're gonna get it from the database. So we'll make a new variable called restaurants. And finally, you know, somebody asked earlier, why is this stuff async? Well, now we have an external dependency. We have to go call Mongoose over the network and we need to wait for that response to come back. So in JavaScript, when we're making an asynchronous function call, we use the await keyword if we want to wait for it to come back. And we're gonna take the restaurant model that we just made in the other file. Here, it just imported it for me. And we'll use dot find on the restaurant. And that's going to you know, get all of the restaurants in our um, database. You know, if you put something in here, like if I wanted to find it by the ID, I could say with the ID of ABC, but we wanna get them all. So if you leave it empty like that, it will get all of the records. And then we wanna, we want to spell restaurants right. <laughs> um, we're going to return it just the same. OK. Um, I'm just going to show you real quick. Uh, I, I need to put this back in here in order to show you um, without breaking the API. Let's just like add in here like so bar. OK. Um, Oh, we'll have to call this something else. We'll just call it R for now. Ah. Okay, because it was colliding with that name. I just want to show you what happens now. We have our local restaurants with the foo bar. What happens now if we hit Postman? Save and restart. We should expect to get an empty array, not something with foo, because our database is empty right now. So I'm going to go back to Postman, get all of our restaurants, and it should now be empty. Look at that. It's not using this local foo anymore, but it is connecting to a remote database. That's awesome. Just need to finish the rest of them real quick. Get rid of this. Uh, any place where we're doing talking to a database, we're gonna replace it with our Mongo stuff. So instead of restaurants.push, which we had before, we're gonna add a We don't have to add an ID anymore. 
Mongo automatically adds a random ID to each record. So we don't have to do that manually. We can get rid of this nano ID up here. Don't need it anymore. Um, we, our new restaurant properties are in the body, yes. But to create our new restaurant, we'll say await restaurant.create. And we'll give it the properties of our restaurant here. And that's awesome. That's it. We've now got our new restaurant here and we can just send it back. It's much easier, right? Um, um, Mongo saves each record with an ID with underscore in front of it like this. And when you get them back, you also have the underscore there. That's not what our schema is expecting. So there's just a really quick hack um, you can find online to when you're connecting your database, you can configure it a little bit to send back. Oh, I got Lennon saying it's lagging. Yeah, I'm so sorry. My internet seems to be a little weak right now. Um, can you guys still hear me? We're so, so close. I promise we're gonna finish soon. Can you hear me? All right, awesome. Um, so like I said, uh, there's a quick hack we can do to convert that underscore ID into just ID. And you know, I had to find this online. I'm just gonna copy paste it and you can copy paste from me, my gift to you. Uh, you'll have this code, don't worry. So in our server.js, right after we connect to the database, <clears throat> um, we're gonna do this configuration. All it's doing is like whenever we're converting something to JSON uh, in our response, it's gonna create a virtual ID based off of the underscore ID and transform it um, from that. So you don't have to understand how this works at all. To be honest, I don't really, um, but I know that this works. So this is a little patch. You can copy it for me later. All right. So now we don't have to worry about this underscore ID thing. Real quick, let's uh, try this out. We're going to send to our post request to make a new restaurant. Uh, body must have a property name. That's because we're stuck on foo here. Back to name. OK, now we've added a new restaurant. We're getting back a Mongo ID. We could send a couple more. All right. Now we can get our restaurants because we've coded that one. Hopefully this isn't empty anymore. Bam, we're getting real you know, database data from our remote MongoDB. And that means we can kill our server, all right? And we can start it again, npm run dev. And we shouldn't have lost these, but we click send again. We still have our, our data and it's persisting. Okay, so, Really, um, there's, like, there's like two more in here, you know, or three, I guess, for getting a restaurant and updating a restaurant, deleting a restaurant. Um, we, we haven't updated our old code yet. I feel like I've gone quite a bit over time. Um, so you can just look at how we change like each of these three lines in the example code, if you'd like. Uh, Omkar saying it's interesting. We want to extend a bit more but also understand what will be possible for you. Like, it's fine for me. I just feel bad because it's been two hours now that you've been listening almost. Do you want to do like the last three or how are you doing? You got no issues. Well, if anybody does have to like, you know, take a little break or, you know, go do some other meeting, that's fine. Um, there'll be a recording, but I'm just gonna plow through this, okay? Uh, first time doing this workshop, I learned it's a bit longer to teach than I anticipated. Um, that's all right, it's an experience. All right, just to make sure that I leave you understanding everything, let's go and code those last ones real quick. <clears throat> all right, next one is getting a restaurant. Uh, is yeah, would you would you want to take a five minute break because you have also been speaking for straight up two hours, right? Uh, yeah, sure. I'll I'll we'll just take a little break. I'll answer a couple of the questions. Um, feel free to go grab some water and you know, stop your head from spinning. I know it's a lot of information we've covered. Yeah. Someone yeah, has an yeah. exam, we have to leave. All right, no problem, Sean. Um, look at the code later if you wanna fill the, the final gaps, it will all be there. Yeah.
Yeah, um, yeah, it's 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 really full of learning. Um, so if you have any questions right now, we might want to take it up, right? Um, else we will just kind of you know do a little water break of five minutes. Uh, it's it's almost twelve right now, so we'll start at twelve zero five. Meanwhile, um, have you folks been tweeting? I see a lot of tweets out there. Um, you know, share your learnings. What you have learned from this workshop. I've learned a lot. Uh, you know, this is a really good refresher. Um, so yeah, thank you, Claire, for that. Thank you for your patience. I it went faster in my head. <laughs> it's always different when you do it out loud. Yeah, yeah, but but I guess yesterday also, you know, with the Ken's workshop, um, it, it's something which which I I feel should happen so that you know attendees would be like, oh, okay, this is how I debug it. Okay, if that happens with me, right? <laughs> if everything goes perfectly, you know, <laughs> it, it's it's never gonna happen, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, sometimes live debugging is valuable too. Um, exactly. you know, everything we showed with like request validation, if that was like over your head, don't worry about it. <clears throat> that can be an extra thing. Maybe you don't do that in the short, um, hackathon we have, of course, the database thing is pretty important if you want to save your data. So if anything, choose that feature. Yeah. We got a question okay. here. Don't we need to commit the MongoDB session? Like how do you, when you normally interact with the database? Um, so because our MongoDB is in the cloud um, and we're connecting to that database when we start our server, that's down here, right? Um, Mongoose, this library is awesome because I think it's going to disconnect when our server um, turns off and it's going to connect when it turns on because we coded it too. So we don't have to worry about that. Okay. All right. So before the session, I didn't know a single thing about Fastify, and now you can create. It. Yeah, you know, we not only can you create a basic API, we're doing like pretty advanced stuff here. Um, you can create a pretty robust API now. Um, all right. I'm going to continue if that's okay. Has it been or is it too early? I guess we should probably wait. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess on. you know you can continue because we have had a, a good two minute break. So yeah. Yeah, just, just have something to drink and then continue. Oh, so it's the first time in Node.js for many of you. That's awesome. Hopefully it didn't scare you away too much. You know, Node can be a little loosey-goosey coming from other languages, but uh, Fastify is awesome. All right, yeah. we're gonna continue. I know it's a little bit uh, before the time we said, but yeah, I also yeah. want to let you go. And yeah, a lot sure, of you are studying too. Can you please address doubts on Q&A? Yeah, I'll do that in a bit. So service, we're gonna finish the last three. Um, getting a restaurant. Before we were filtering an RA. Now uh, we are just gonna do a simpler thing. We can get our restaurant by saying const restaurant equals await for that response from our restaurant model that it's attached to the MongoDB to find by ID as a function. And it works exactly like you would think. You just pass it an ID. This is gonna return any restaurant that has that ID. If, if there is none, it's gonna come back undefined. So our if statement works exactly like before. If it exists, send it back. If not, send 404. Let's test it out real quick with Postman. I'll grab Darius quantify and we'll do get place that ID in there. You should expect Darius to come back and it does. Awesome. Our database is performing well for us. The last two updating restaurants. Um, before we had all this going on in our database. Now we don't even need this find index thing. That was for our array, but we do. Um, need to do the exact same thing that we did in the previous one, right? We have to get the restaurant by ID. And then we just update it. And again, Mongoose is awesome. Say await the restaurant that we got up here from the database and just say dot update, plain English. And we'll pass the new request body in there and it's gonna perform everything for us. Awesome. Last one. What do you think it's going to look like? 
Um, exact same as above. We're going to get the restaurant from Mongoose, from Mongo, I guess, using Mongoose. <clears throat> and instead of update, like we did here, we're going to use delete. So we've replaced now all of our, oh, no, actually, it's not delete. I was thinking of a different thing. There's a special one called uh, find by ID and remove ID. Maybe there is a delete one. I didn't look at the um, documentation close enough, but I know that this one exists. You can find by the ID and remove it. But of course, first we want to check and make sure that the restaurant exists. And because we're not doing the um, array index method anymore, we can get rid of that. We need to do that here as well. We forgot. Okay. So checking if the restaurant exists and then doing the update and doing the delete. Let's check these last two in Postman, make sure everything's working. Uh, let, let's make updated for not ABC. We don't have that anymore. So let's grab Darius and in the put request, use that ID, change all the properties to update. Hit send, we get back 204. We'll get uh, Darius again. Now it says updated. So update's working. Now let's delete Darius. Bam, 500 internal find by ID and remove is not a function. Is it? Did I spell it wrong? Find by ID and remove. Oh, yeah. Oops. We need to use capital R. That's our, our mongoose um, instance, my bad. Good thing we checked. That's why we use Postman to debug. That was a 500 error. It means we did something wrong in the server. That was me. Now it's gone. We got 204. And now if we try to get Darius, it should be a 404. And it is. There we have it, you all. We've <laughs> coded the API with a database and validation. That's pretty advanced. Um, I'm going to be sharing all this code. Thank you to everyone that's sharing the docs in there. Final, final notes here. Um, we've been like manually checking everything, like, oh, we're going to be expecting 404. Um, in the, the in the resources, there's going to be further reading. If you'd like to use Postman's test tab to kind of not have to have a human checking this stuff, you know, you can check um, just even clicking. You can compose some tests, like expecting status code to be 200 and all the type of thing. There's a lot you can do there. Um, that's going to be in the the um, resources. Also, now that we've coded our API. Generating documentation for it is as easy as clicking generate API documentation, you know, and saying restaurant API docs. Now you have documentation. The reason you might want it different than your test is you might change the order of your tests and stuff, but the documentation, it's nice to have this all, you know, as the schema would have it. You can click view documentation and actually read it like it was a website. In fact, you can publish it as a website by clicking this publish button. And you'll have public documentation for your API that you can share with anyone. Um, yeah, uh, final, final notes, you guys. I know I've said that several times. I just really want you to walk away with this. If you're gonna deploy a project, um, there's a couple of free places you can deploy um, your, your node code or any other language that you're gonna be coding in. Glitch, Railway, Heroku, these are all um, great options. Database hosting, you got MongoDB Atlas, Superbase, Firebase. Um, note that Railway and Heroku also host databases. So there's plenty of free resources out there for you to host. Your student leaders will help you with that if you choose to deploy. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna leave you with these three things. You need to define an API a schema as your single source of truth. If you want to make the API first approach in your development, you've already done that. You can implement your schema however you want. Today we use Node. I structured the code in one way, but again, that's totally up to you as long as you honor the schema. You know, you protect that contract. Postman is gonna help you every step of the way. You know, from the very beginning, we generated that test collection. We were back and forth in between Postman debugging finding bugs in my code and correcting them immediately. 
And then of course, you know, after we've built it, you could share the documentation right away. So you can see how Postman plus API first is like the perfect, the perfect pair. And again, I'll share these slides with all these resources and that is it. That I promise you that is it. <laughs> thank you all for your patience. Um, thank you all the student leaders that answered the many questions in the chat as well. And yeah, Lennon asked, can you make the Postman public workspace and share? Um, actually, I can't <laughs> uh, because I'm on a team at Postman and I can apply to make it public, but it's gonna take a little time until Abhinav wakes up tomorrow. So <laughs> um, unfortunately I can't make it public. However, you already have an API in your workspace. You have the schema. I'm gonna share the code. So you can just literally copy paste the schema in there and you'll have all this stuff. Okay. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, you know, it has been awesome, I guess, yeah. Thank you for your patience. <laughs>